Welcome to the weekly probate mastery group coaching call. Kat, do you have anything that you'd like to start with? Not to put Shirley on the spot. She just introduced herself as having infinite banking as part of her skill set. I haven't heard you talk about that in a while, and it's something I always love hearing about. Did you say infinite banking or infinite thinking? Because I'm cursed with both. <laughs> My newest infinite banking is buying real estate and putting home equity lines against it rather than uh, cat rather than a cash out refi. And I've been infinite banking that way, using this easy debt that we have. What's your methodology, Shirley? I actually use whole life. Uh, you, I have index universal life as my vehicle of choice in that space, mainly because all the other riders and if there's a lot of several new faces here. I chose index universal life, which is a whole life. They call it a rich man's Roth. It was a loophole left open. So it gives you all the benefits of a, of an IRA with none of the real restrictions. But the bigger reason for me at 35 years old, helping so many families in this end of life transition, I realized you probably should have long-term care insurance, disability, chronic illness, terminal illness. And those are expensive when you have individual policies for each of those. So when I looked across the whole landscape of available insurance for the investment utility of it, as well as the actual benefit, an IUL or an index universal life policy was the one I chose. And just like with, with any other whole life policy, it has all the benefits of borrowing against it. Mine is indexed to the S and P 500 and then that indexes every two months. So as the market rises, I'm not actually invested in equities, but I'm indexed to the equities market, but there's a 0% floor. So I can't, if the market corrects, I'll stop out at where my last index point. And if the market goes up, there's no cap on it. It'll continue to rise. I don't usually mess around much with complex financial instruments, but there are hundreds and hundreds of them out there and there are a few good ones, but that's what I use as index universal life which will give you access to funds. You, if you end up terminally ill or disabled, you can trigger the death benefit while you're alive and have bucket list money. Really neat tools. I have a question. How did you find the index universal life? Lots of kissing frogs to find the one that I trusted. So the one I, I originated with Minnesota life and they were uh, not too long after that bought out by Securian. S-E-C-U-R-I-A-N. So Securian Financial has an IUL policy. As, as I said, there are hundreds of them out there that are really complex. A lot of them will have caps on them without floors, opposite of what I have. So just be really careful. Ray Perkins is, is a contact that I have. It's all he does. I challenged a few professionals to bring me financial products that made sense. Most of them don't. And this was one I was like, wow, you found something. So I can give you guys Ray Perkins. Uh, it'll be in the show notes and uh, we'll post it with, with the call in the group. But Raymond Perkins is the one I would recommend to help navigate that world. Shirley, tell us, are you using yours for your real estate finance draft? I'm a licensed practitioner. I help people with uh, setting it up. I'm up here in Canada though. We're just a team up here as well. So I'm trying to get all my wheels together. I've gone on, gone off onto these, all these little areas and I thought I was going to do them individually, but then I found you and the more I just like, oh my gosh, I can bring that in. I can bring that in. I can bring that in. That's where I'm at right now. I found the CIBC with the... I was sitting as a corporation. I wasn't, and I was looking at real estate investing through corporate funds and things like that. And just did a wrong, some wrong things. As long as I've been in 20, 26 years, I've been in real estate, but still the ins and outs are you learn the hard way sometimes. And there was some of that. And then I found that concept. It really intrigued me. So it's like, okay, I got to go down that education and, and get that skill. And so I have a great group up here in Canada that's helping. There's lots of real estate investors that, that are using it. We personally don't use universal index. We put it on to the actual life insurance company. So then we don't have to worry about it. They set up their guarantees. There's dividends on top of that. There's a death benefit. It just helps overall for an investor with regards to capital gains, probate, lots of various things that people just aren't aware of. And then on top of that, if investors are having, I don't know about in the States, but in Canada, all of a sudden the bank will say, oh, you've got five doors. No, we're not loaning on another one. And it's very frustrating to investors. So it's just another way that they can compound and grow 
all at the same time. So it's really having your money do two things at once. So um, yep. you don't use that that compounding, as everybody knows the penny scenario. And if you take it out of day 15, you're a lot less than if you didn't take it out on day 15 of what that 30 day, what that penny does. So that's the concept behind it allows you to be able to have a collateral loan with your insurance company against it. It doesn't go on your credit check. So nobody even knows that you have it. And it's a nice way to be able to use your funds instead of having to refi all the time, which starts the clock all over again. So all you're doing is paying interest. I know you're using other people's money, but it's not always a clear cut on that. They don't ask why you want the money, they ask what it's for. So when you've got these kind of obscure things of, you know, investments that are opportunities that you want to take. And the bank goes, no, we're not going to do that. But you still feel deep in your heart. That's an opportunity you want to take. Then there's no questions asked by the insurance company. So it's just another great tool to have. And as you say, like I've been listening to you, Chad, on some of your previous meetings, there's just a lot of ways that we're not protecting ourselves. And it's just a win-win. You're able to use it when you're alive. And then it's still there for your family, for your legacy. I just think of anybody who's got more than five doors, their capital gains, at least in Canada, because that we're taxed, because we got to pay for everything. It's astronomical. I'm starting to run those numbers even into probate. I didn't even think about that. I've gone through probate with my mom's um, estate. She was second to die. I've lost both my parents. And so I've been through that. And that's where I came in this is this, I could help families. Maybe that's, and I wasn't even bringing in, you know, my knowledge with regards to pre-probate. And I think that's where I'm really starting to, to see where all my skills come into place there because I've got my appraisal designation as well. But anyway, that's just my two cents worth. So I won't keep it. Well, great. You've, you've got a, a vertically integrated service right there in your office. So that's great. That's what we were striving for is to provide as many options as you can and be able to monetize as many of those as you can. I'm curious, it sounds like you're on the more advanced end of the insurance spectrum. Do you have captive insurance in Canada? Have you, you have any experience with captive insurance company? I've never heard of captive. So in the States, and this is an old law on the books, but insurance companies in the United States do not pay income tax on the first million and a half in revenue. If you own multiple entities, you can start your own captive insurance company and you can actually charge, you know, company B would be the captive insurance company. It would charge company A typically a high premium and that money is income tax free. So it's a way to move capital between entities. And then that captive insurance entity, just like any insurance company actually has a pool of premium capital that's used as investment capital. And as long as your earnings are under a million and a half, it's tax free. So you can grow the hell out of a small business by designated a, a, a captive insurance company. Now, the one caveat I will give you, and there's plenty of, there are case laws, multiple case laws defending this and, and validating it. However, the IRS does not like it. If you have less than a million dollars a year in revenue in entity A, and you're paying big premiums to entity B, it can be dangerous. It can be a, an audit red flag and you will win in court. You will just be at court arguing your case. So it's your burden to defend yourself. As you move up the wealth scale, if you have three to $4 million a year in revenue, though, it's a tactic of billionaires. It's one of those progressive way to use insurance, but you can actually really maximize profitability in both entities by, by utilizing tools like captive insurance. So anyway, I don't know if you have those in Canada. Our insurance companies are fully regulated by the Grand Ba Poobah. So Do I hear Ontario in, in your voice? Yeah, I'm in Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. Are you in the GTA? Just west of it. Yeah. I'm between uh, Toronto and London. Okay. I know where you're at. Oh, good. It's snow. Uh, That's all I can say. Stanley, I got a hand up. Stanley, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. What's going on, Chad? How are you? Hear me better. I know uh, you had difficulty hearing me during the last week's call. Yeah, it was very in and out. It would go, it had peaks and valleys. You sound good today. Yeah, I think it's uh, my network, but hopefully it cooperates this time. Yeah. What can we help you with today? Okay. I took heed to a lot of the things that you told me last week in regards to automating the marketing. And I created a role play group with me in another. Oh, yeah. yeah. Say that again. Have you had your first meeting? How are you feeling about your, your role play? So he is experienced and I told him I'm a novice. He just challenged me right away. He threw out a scenario and we just role played it. And he was impressed actually. That just comes from me listening to a lot of the things that you had to say and just really taking a mental note. Awesome, man. I'm glad you're jumping in with both feet, participating in the community. That's awesome. 
And I'm glad that you found the community member that's willing to step up and help you. Absolutely. I love, and I, I just give all thanks to you for everything that you created. Thank you for being here and being part of it, brother. I have a question. Okay. I remember oftentimes when you reach out to family, you would, you would just present yourself as Chad. You would not add any title to your name whatsoever until you figure out how you'll be able to help these families. And when marketing and sending direct mail, do you recommend adding a company logo? Do you recommend adding any titles? How would you go about that? Are you licensed? No, but I am. <laughs> I'm going to have to work towards it. I know you beat up a lot of people about that. That's right. So until then, you don't really have a compliance to meet. When you have your license, you'll need to make sure if there's any offer of brokerage, any mention of brokerage, even if it could be construed as that, you do need to have your, your minimum compliance information that your, your state recommend or demands. And what I would do is put that in number eight font in the footer. Like I would just make a vertical line and then have my brokerage name, address, phone number. And in Virginia, we didn't, we don't require state license number. I think California, I was compliant. So my team was Corbett real estate. Like when that was at the top of the letter, it made it seem like this was just a real estate conversation. If you have a brand that's something like stanleytransitions.com, where it's more relevant to their emotional state and their situation, then the brand can make your letter even more impactful. But if it's like ABC real estate investing, or we buy houses cash LLC, that's not the kind of brand you want at the top of a letter when you're just trying to make the, the right first impression. I helped a, a gentleman early in this part of my career. We created, it was in Ohio the transition team and that became his brand. So we had logos and that with him, like we proudly branded the transition team as the author of the letter and Jeff was the founder of that. But if it's just ABC real estate, a lot of times you can switch people off before they even get to the copy. The logo will kill you because if it just looks like a typical brokerage offer, they've already got, they've already seen that. So any, any time you have questions in, in this space, get in that empathetic state. What are they going through? What are their struggles? What is the day-to-day? -day? What are they thinking about? And how can I differentiate myself by making a different and better first impression? When it comes to the words you use, the logos you use, the calls to action, the PS line, consider all of those things. What, what you end up with is a letter or a marketing campaign that's authentic to who you are and what you're offering rather than taking a template and throwing your logo on it and firing it out the door. If you do that extra work, if you do that mindset work and really think you know, about, okay, where would they be? What are they thinking about? What might be valuable to them at this time? And then take those letter templates and customize them to really fit your specific offer that you've come up with. Awesome. It's a handwritten thought. Do you think if they're all handwritten, I know it's going to take more time. I've tried a little bit of everything. And, and honestly, like when I first started marketing as an investor, I, I bought into the yellow letter. I you know that was uh, 14 years ago. So I don't know, a decade ago. Uh, and I did every letter. Like I had a designer make a template where I could buy yellow paper and actually print it out as it would print the lines like yellow legal paper. And I captured my handwriting and, and had that in a thought and it took a bunch of effort. What I found is other people were doing that and it didn't have that big of an impact where I had the, the biggest shift in, in response rate was when I just typed up the letters and focused on the copywriting, getting the components of the letters, a non-threatening introduction, a call to action in the last paragraph, sign your name. The PS line is honestly the biggest reason you send the letter is the PS. And that's where in mind it's PS. If you're not ready to talk to anyone just yet, be sure to check us out at, and then send them to wherever, you know, they can learn the most about you. Website, Facebook group, whatever you'd like to use there. But for the ones that aren't ready to PS and most of them won't be on the very first touch, the PS line is a really great way, an unthreatening way to introduce them to something. Now, an idea we discussed last week was building a community focused Facebook group where you could have the, the top vendors or team members come in and actually explain their service, what they do, how that's valuable to families. That's a good thing to use in the PS lines. PS, if you're not ready to talk to anyone just yet, be sure to show up on Wednesday night at eight in the Louisiana probate Facebook group and just give them the exact name of it. Just say, go to Facebook, search this name and request to join. We'll let you in. But that's a really good PS call to action is you're not asking them to do anything other than come and get value. 
So focus more on really honing your offer. Like if you want to experiment, experiment with the opening paragraph and, and the, the closing PS line or the two things that really I could measure a difference in response rate more off of those two parts of the letter than anything else I changed. I did this meticulously through my first 12,000 pieces of mail, and then I just started to shoot from the hip and try things. And the letters that are there, I've, and that's, those are the mag, they have the magic components. They were the ones that worked. Definitely personalize them to your own, to your own service, your own kind of culture. Because most of the word is written by some damn West Virginia hillbilly. Oh man. Have you ever been to uh, the devil's baptism? No, that's actually in Virginia. That's closer to my other house in Roanoke and down in at Southwestern Virginia, but I still have not gone. It looks like a really cool spot. And one final question I have for you, Chad. All the leads does include a return address, correct? It's that's up to you. So that's one thing that I did ultimately take off of my letters because without a return address and a greeting card envelope there, the likelihood of it being opened is much greater in my opinion. So I ended up taking the return addresses off and pretty much always maintained like a 2% response rate with like within the week that I actually mailed the letters. Now, over time, you would get people that called you because they got your letter six months ago, but I could pretty much always count on a hundred letters out, two calls in within five business days of sending it. Appreciate that, Chad. Uh, is there anything that I can do to, to help? I'm not here just to take. I definitely want to give as well. Keep showing up, man. There's always somebody that you can help. You get, you've got community members helping you and, and helping you beat the learning curve. Just be here and do that for the next guy. All right. Sounds good. Right. Thanks for your time. Keep asking, keep asking questions. Keep raising your hand and sharing your experience with us. Everybody here needs encouragement from time to time. So come back and tell us all your success stories, what's working, what's not. All right. Definitely will. Yep. Thank you. Richard is up. Just uh, real quickly. So, cause this line of, of calling is totally different. You're dealing with a bunch of family members, really peculiar when, in my case, but I just, sometimes I don't know how to handle this. So if you get like a shutdown from the actual uh, representative or the executor, if you get a shutdown from them, you're supposed to still continue calling the family members, the heirs. Probably not, because even if you're successful there, you're going to have to earn your way back in with, with that person. So just start there and earn your way back in with that person. If I got shut down hard by the executor, but I had his wife's number and I built rapport with her and it was going well, the handoff is going to make more likely than not, his ego is going to make his marriage contentious when she tries to hand it off. What? You mean that's how I hung up on last Wednesday? And I don't ever want to add more stress to the situation. So if I knew that I had a good number for him, even if it didn't end on a good note, I would still call him again before I tried to call close family members who would eventually have to hand me off to him anyways. Okay. Got it. Thanks for that. The thing is what I would say, Richard is, is, and this is, I'm pretty tough on myself. Like the way I built my sales language is being very self-critical. But you should always know why that person, what, what you said or how you said, or if you were even responsible, but try to understand every time you're rejected, do, do your best to understand exactly what happened there. Was it your fault or were they just having a bad day? Did you say something, did you overstep your bounds and say something that, that triggered them or are they just an unreasonable person? It's, there's a million different answers uh, or scenarios, but understanding, like just, just really paying close attention to what you said, what you got in response. That's what helped me really build, you know, the ability to have these as fluid conversations, even though they're pretty sensitive situations. When you do have one of those hard rejections, ask yourself the question, honestly, like what the hell, did, where did I lose control of that? And go back and, and, you know, think about what you said and where you lost control. Did you have rapport and did you, or did you never get there? And just that, that being self-critical without beating yourself up, just saying, Hey, where'd you lose that one can really help you identify where you're tripping up. Yeah. I believe that's do my clarity of my, uh, my initial pitch is, is not super clear. Uh, cause I get people telling me, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. I, I got a few of them telling me, well, we're all done. We're all finished. It's either I believe it or not. Sometimes it's true. So about 25% of your list are going to, they'll understand what probate is. They, they've been through it before. They're proactive this time because they have experience on it for grandma or on it for their sister or something like that. So in my experience, about a quarter of the list truly doesn't need your help. Another quarter is going to fumble through it and do it on their own, no matter what. 
they're gonna they're just that hard headed. Another quarter will go find somebody they know to help them, a realtor they've known in the past or an investor will they'll respond to that offer. And then that last quarter is the ones that that we will ultimately help that we'll reach over. So don't feel bad when you uncover the ones that don't need your help. Not everybody's going to. Even our top performers that, that are in seven and eight figures of revenue are making, we're, we're looking at five, six, seven percent conversion rates. So at best, you've got a 93% failure rate if you're around the top of the industry. So don't let those concern you too much because we can't help everybody, but we're really focused on who is that two to six percent that we can reach this month. Just one more question. So if, if you get shut down, he's like, no, I'm good. Don't call me no more. Would you recommend just showing up at the house? Not the same day, but just knocking on the door. If you're ever going to re-enter a contentious conversation, do it with value. Depending on how much information you were able to gather before you got shut down, you may know exactly something very specific that's relevant to their situation that you can bring in. If you don't have that information, something that's valuable to almost every family in, in probate is if they have, if there is real estate in the estate, you have the tools and, and the market knowledge to do it. Offer them a, a CMA or I like a market absorption analysis because it is a little more confusing. It is, it's a 360 view. It looks at all inventory types of expired, pending, active. It looks at all, all inventory, not just sold inventory. The other reason I really like the market absorption analysis is unless you really understand real estate analytics, it's confusing. Like it's a little overwhelming. So you almost need me to translate it. So I don't put it in a really concise, easy to understand report. I'll put it in a, kind of a, a bit of an intimidating document where they're like, what, what does this even mean? What are all these numbers? Oh, I'm glad you called back. Let me walk you through it. And I can make it very concise and very unthreatening and easy to understand. But without me, it's not a very useful tool, but that elicits the response. So that's why I really like the, M, the market absorption analysis better than a CMA. Almost every family would find value in that. So I would just recommend drop by and drop it in a mailbox. If it was a really contentious hang up, like they, they said, don't you ever call my family again, but you think they were just having a bad day. They're raw. Something you can do is just drop by the subject property and just drop it in the mailbox and say, we spoke, it didn't end on a great note. I, I do want to respect your privacy. So I thought I would leave this here. So when you check the mail, there's some way that I could help you, even though you told me you didn't need it. And 50% of those, they'll be in a different mood the day they go there and pick up the mail. Um, yeah, you'll get some response off of those, but I would do something indirect and a little not in their face. Don't put yourself in a position where, where they feel like they have to reject you even harder. Do something softly, like the, something subtle like that, that, that actually is valuable. And a number of them will call you back. And I've gotten apologies. So people will call back, listen, I hung up on you back in, in, in April and we just, we, we hadn't even started all this. And now we're just damn confused. We're lost on it. So I'm sorry that I did that. Can you please help me? And of course I smile and, and move forward and help them. So you never know who, who is going to need your help in a couple of months, but don't push too hard on them. This is not a list to really aggressively pursue. You'll just end up screwing up your reputation, but there's things where you can add value subtly by doing things like that. And that's a good way to re-enter the conversations. Thank you, Ken. So Michael had a question here. So Mike said, as I assemble my vendor team, one benefit to me will be referrals they send me. I would like to send referrals to them also, but if my team is too big, I don't know how I can keep them all supplied with leads. How can I manage an equitable referral partner relationship with all of them? Get busy, man. Like I hear a lot of people are concerned about this. It's not as problematic as you're thinking it's going to be. How many times have you ever gotten a referral and you're like, that son of a hasn't sent me one of those for three months. Usually your response is, that's really great. I love referrals. Let me call them immediately. And that's what's happening on the other end. Like you're building a team of people that trust you and believe in the offer that you're presenting to the community. If they're judgmental and don't appreciate your referrals, you pick the wrong one, go replace them. But I don't think it's something you need to worry about if you're working with the right people. Um, and if they are attracted to the offer the, that you're presenting to the community, they're probably altruistic people and they're not like keeping score and, and they don't view themselves as a shark or a lion in business. Attorneys is where it's most complicated because you want to continue building relationships with new attorneys, but you want to nurture those relationships that you've already gotten. You may just be transparent about it and say, listen, I, you're a great attorney and I, I know a few others, so I'm going to do a round robin. 
or I'm going to interview the families and I will actually choose which attorney I think is the best fit based on personality or culture or geographic location. And you can justify, you know, the referrals and be like, Hey Mike, I just sent one of these to your competitor because he's in a different zip code and it was way closer to the family, but you're in the next slot. But I've actually never had a vendor even say, Hey man, I'm getting the referrals from you lately. It's, they're just grateful when they do get them. So. That's my advice. Let's see. Stanley, you might want to look in the chat. You've got some folks wanting to be in your role play group. Yeah, Bill Gross, I just saw your comment. Uh, please jump in and uh, share your advice with Richard. Yeah, the question always is, you have to take responsibility for what happened. It doesn't mean you're at fault or you should get punished, but when everybody hangs up on you, it's a negative experience. You should ask yourself the question, what could I have done differently that would have got the result that I wanted? Yeah, it doesn't mean you beat yourself up. It doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means like you said, had I, if I had better rapport earlier in the conversation, it would have gone differently. Of course, some people are impossible. You can't win them all, but you always want to improve. You want to improve your game every phone call. Thank you, Bill. Hey, Chad. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just curious though. That's why I sent you the question there online. I just signed up for ATL information, but I've noticed several executives, administrators that they marked in red and they're all the do not call us. And I'm scratching my head thinking, okay. I should respect that, but then the other half of my brain says, being out of state, they need our help more than anything. But I'm concerned about getting myself into trouble. So Definitely right about the out of help more than anyone. They moved away a long time ago. They don't really have fresh contacts. A lot of times folks will prioritize their list by calling the out of town executors first, because they're most likely to need help. And it's really easy to find property preservation or you know, there's a million reasons like putting up no trespassing signs is a really good way to have an excuse to go by and check out the house. As far as DNC, are you your brokerage and investor? I'll be approaching this originally here, Chad, as a real estate broker. Yeah. As a broker. There's, um, there's more liability. Here's the deal. What in the time from 2013 till 2020, when I was all with all the leads, we had over 7 million phone calls that, that went out that were tracked. I'm aware of one inbound phone call from an, an FCC attorney in Southern New York that called one of our prospectors and said, listen, we had a complaint that you called a family on do not call. Can you please not do that? They didn't even issue a written complaint. It was just, it was a warning phone call. So that's the most severe consequence I've seen in my career. Now I have seen much more severe consequences on TCPA, where if you're texting without explicit written consent, I've seen people pinched and I've been pinched on text marketing. But with DNC, I will say that we've had literally thousands of people, you know, they made their own decision. They, they should, they assess their own risk, but the majority of people that I've ever watched do this, they call them. And we have had opinions from attorneys who are saying it's not a solicitation, it's an offer of service. Therefore, it doesn't violate it. I think if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. But I think your risk is, there's no great risk. And if you ever do call someone that says, listen, I'm on DNC, how would you get this number? Sorry, my assistant pulled it from somewhere. I'll make sure we remove it from our list. And you'll probably never get someone who's going to pursue you over that. And if the FCC ever does, if they don't see a pattern where you've called that person more than once, they enforce from the, the top down. They're looking for big carriers and robo dollars and call centers that are every day violating. So I don't see, that's a long answer, but I don't see a whole lot of personal liability for you, but it's, it's your assets to protect. So you got to make your own decisions. I appreciate that. One out of seven million. Hopefully I wouldn't be the second out of that group, but I'll give it a try. If I have any resistance, I will let you guys know. I'm in the Southern California area. Yeah. yeah again, it's, I don't get too concerned when people are calling DNC. If you're texting without actual opt-in, that's when I get really concerned because there are plenty of attorneys running their businesses on that now, and they're not looking for litigation. They're just looking for a quick shakedown settlement. All right. Who else? Super Geo. I see your hand up. How are you? Sir? Hey, good. Thank you. Just in a quick scenario, I, I like to get information on my calls and I've been on these calls before and I've been told, just make the call, don't try to get all the background information, read into any of the leads. I made a call, I looked at my CRM and was a, it was in a trust and I was about to not make the call. I said, why would I make the call if it's in a trust, but I ended up making the call and to my surprise, got into the conversation and. It was the husband of the wife, the executor, and he basically said they can't find the original trust. 
And so it's a scenario where I got a chance to talk to them and he really needs my help. So I just uh, comment that I'm taking it to heart now. Don't try to read too much into the detail of, of the list and just make the call and try to be of service. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Most people would probably think well, that's a mistake. There's no way I'm going to call that. There's no way I trust is on probate. But as you get to know John Fraker, who's here today, you'll hear some stories about improperly funded trusts. And a lot of times trusts weren't structured. You know, they, they didn't finish. They started and didn't finish correctly. And their a probate is still necessary. John, what advice would you have that you might be able to help him if a trust agreement cannot be found and was not recorded? What options do they really have? Honestly, I check with you, an attorney in your jurisdiction. For, there's a couple of different angles, right? So again, in California, the probate code gives any probate court jurisdiction over all living trusts, regardless of anything. So whether the asset is in probate or whether it's in the trust, regardless of that, the court still has jurisdiction over it, depending on which way you go. I had one that was fascinating. A gentleman died like in the 19, late 1950s, if you could believe it, in another state. And uh, he basically gave his wife a lifetime right of occupancy in their house, all the right to the money. When she died, it went to their kid died before the wife. And so like, it didn't have a clean and easy remote contingency clause, which says if everybody I've named is dead, it goes to this person. A whole bunch of the stuff in the trust is self-defeating. So we had to go to court with that trust and petition for instructions, have the judge tell us who gets this money. And it was crazy because that was like three, four generations ago. And the people that were named in it were like, most of them were long gone. It's not uncommon at all that a trust winds up in probate court. It happens all the time. Either you're going there for instructions. If there's an asset that people think is supposed to be in trust, but it's not, and you can't find any deed with the house, the house is basically the estate's more or less intestate, which means no will, no trust. I have one of those right now where we ransacked everything the person had looking for a copy of a trust, but all we had was family rumors people meaning to get around to it. And that's the most, that's the most common thing in the probate system. People are meant to get around to it. So people were crystal clear on what was supposed to happen. But if you don't have the trust and you have no way of finding it after doing a thorough exhaustive search, you just got to go assuming there was none. So it depends on that family's unique situation, but ultimately the course, the path ahead is going to have to be an attorney in that jurisdiction that helps you helps guide them. Through. The interesting thing about this particular scenario is the, is there are two, there are four heirs to the estate and two of them are for a better term unemployed and they're not allowing access to the home. Basically they're buying time and it's a real tough situation for them to try to work together to get resolution. You're describing my whole career, man. Every estate has the family, we call them the family passenger, the free loader, the free ride, man. I like, we could do five of these hour long seminars. And I can just go story after story and I wouldn't even get through half of them. Just the nuts stuff that happens. Yet one guy like harassed the realtor, tried to block his car in. Man, it was funny. <laughs> it was even funnier because that estate came to me from a friend of mine who's a realtor. This is before I was licensed. And uh, he didn't get the listing. And then two years later, I ran into him. I'm like, that's the best thing that ever happened to you and your family, man. There's no amount of money that was worth dealing with that bad, crazy family. You should have run, not walk away from that family. So good luck to you. So Gio, do you know if they are currently working with an attorney or are they have they just made a arbitrary call based on an ad, uh, the attorneys, based on what my discussions with them, they, he seems to be very hands off to the situation. And I've asked what guidance has he provided? And they've stated well, they're trying to get access to the deceased computer. And that's a big, and, and supposedly the trust was set up 15 years ago, but again, no document, no. And it's also on a reverse. So it's just a mess basically. And they can't get access to documents. So they don't know where things are at because the daughter that's preventing entry or access to any of the, the paperwork or the information. I'm just going to try to help them. Pertinent fact. I don't think there's a reverse mortgage company in the country that would write a reverse mortgage to a trust. Maybe I'm wrong, but banks don't like trusts like that. So I would question, is there a trust or did they just think mom and dad did that because they were talking about it 15 years ago? There may not even be one. As far as how you can help them, have you built a relationship with a good estate planning and probate attorney? I guess you could say I have. I've talked to John a couple of times. I've tried to get rid of the problems, man. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Like I mentioned, probably what I mentioned last time is job one. You got, if the house is titled in a trust. Or if it's titled in the decedent's name, that's like threshold number one, right? If the house says living trust, then you got a problem. You have to deal with the trust. It can't be ignored. 
if the house just says person's name or whatever, you're just going a different route. That's step one, figure out how the real estate is titled. Step two on the reverse mortgage thing, you have to find out if that's real and you have to get the paperwork on that. I personally just went through um, a probate that we're doing where there was a reverse mortgage on a house in San Jose that we actually sold it for a flat million. And the lady had a reverse mortgage. I think it was like 200 grand and they tried to foreclose on it. And that was like the most, what's the word, least professional company I've ever dealt with. They straight up lied to me. They lied to the executor, a whole bunch of garbage. All they were trying to do was steal the property. If there's a reverse mortgage, you have a ticking time. And depending on the company that you're dealing with, they will either try to wait you out and try to foreclose on it, or maybe they will give you something in writing saying we're willing to work. As far as the attorney not doing their job, you, anybody has a right to fire their lawyer if they're not doing the right job. So if you have a situation where there's like a lit fuse, a reverse mortgage situation that's creeping up to the deadline when they're going to, when they have the statutory right to foreclose, then the attorney needs to recognize that's a loss to the estate. That's a loss to the executor or the trustee that comes out of there. So the attorney needs to act with some quickness, go into the court, getting at a minimum, either letters of special administration, if it hasn't been opened yet, or some sort of court support for getting in the property, getting access to the paperwork and yep. finding out how to go from there. It's one thing if people, it's a complex situation, people are trying to get their arms around. Again, that's why you need to figure out if the reverse mortgage situation is real, if it is, and there is one, and there's been X number of months since the person died, then they don't really have the option of figuring things out at a slow pace. They got to act with some level of quickness and the courts in California specifically are just a train wreck right now, right? Santa Clara County, where I operate, give me a closing hearing on a probate six months late after I file the petition. I'm like, I'm supposed to sit around for six months and you can't find anywhere on your calendar in the next half a year to get this case closed. Nope. We don't have staff with the backlog in the courts with how jumbled that is. The attorney needs to act with a, a quickness if there is a reverse mortgage, but that's my advice. Number one, find out how that real estate is titled. If it says trust, it can't be ignored. And step two, figure out if that reverse mortgage situation is real and how long ago the person died versus how long they're going to give you. And that's what happened in our situation. It took us, it was an intestate case. It took months to get the case open to find anyone who could do it. There was nobody named and there was no direct relatives or heirs, kids or grandkids who would step up. So there's a whole bunch of that just to get the case open. And all that time, the reverse mortgage company was, oh, you send all this paperwork here. Oh, we lost your paperwork. Start all over. They lied to me on a Friday. They're like, oh, send in this paperwork. We'll consider it. And then on Monday, they're like, oh, we already rejected it. I'm like, well, I hadn't sent you the paperwork. How did you reject the request? You pre-rejected me. And why are you wasting my time asking me to send you paperwork, right? It's a real shady company. Obviously they're trying to steal the house. So for us, that was an easy fix. We sold the property because they had three months before they could touch it. And we got a cash buyer in there and it was gone and told them to take a hike. You got to figure out on the reverse mortgage thing, A, if, the, if there was one, if it's real, when it's due. And then you got to call the attorney directly and be like, Hey man, you got a lit fuse here. What are you going to do about it? What's your yeah. solution? like get in their face if they're not. And I mentioned this before, you have every client has the right to fire their lawyer and get somebody else if they're not doing. Yeah. Great advice, John. Yeah. I was, my approach to this would be, I would either contact the title title company and get, um, get a title search, or I would actually go down and do a prelim myself. Uh, yeah. While I was down there, I would talk to the probate clerk and be like, Hey, who do you think is the most respectable estate planning and probate attorney? Who do you see in and out of here doing good work and try to get a shortcut, line up his replacement. My, I would get in my truck and go straight to his office once I knew if there was a legitimate re reverse mortgage and if it was in the name of the, the decedent or the trust. And I would approach him with that challenge face to face. We both understand what fiduciary means. When the hell are you going to start being one? Because we have a short fuse and, and we need to take action on this. Otherwise you're risking this estate. And if he pushes back or has an ego response and gets defensive, you just go hire the other guy. That would be my, my approach on guys. I have a hard stop. I'd love to, to keep going today. We've got a great turnout, but I do have a hard stop at four o'clock. So I, I do need to run. Thank you guys for being here. Bill Gross, John Frager. Good to see you guys again. Nice to collaborate. All you guys, like, it's so cool to me that you like, you guys have putting the other role play groups, helping each other, mentoring each other. Thanks for being part of this community and for being here today. And we'll talk to you soon.